One can't talk about photorealism without mentioning gallery owner, author, collector, and philanthropist Louis K. Mizell, who invented the term. His galleries are testament to the fact that he is a proponent of photorealism. In fact, the five works we will look at together by Audrey Black, Richard Bell, Richard Estes, Ben Schoenzeit, and Richard Nyweck are either gifts from or on loan from the Mizell family. Photorealism has its roots in California and New York in the late 1960s, bringing its straightforward style of painting into a culture that was defined by pop art, minimalism, land art, and performance art. Many critics call the 13 original photorealists trailblazers who did what every art movement has done through time, explore new ways of seeing the world with the materials available to them and their imaginations. In photorealism, the camera is the source tool for the artist. Photorealists do not paint from observation, but from photographs that are mechanically transferred to canvas by projector, a grid system, or tracing paper. Sometimes the photo is from a newspaper or other contemporary medium, but many artists take their own photographs. The invention of digital photography, the convenience of iPhones and computers has made it easier for artists to capture their source imagery that is the starting point for their creative process. What are some of photorealism's traits? Most are very large works of art, often reflecting our popular cultural icons, such as cars and billboards, diners and wind-up toys, as well as personal and autobiographical stories. There is an abundance of detail, layering of colors and subjects, detached perspective, flattened space, and the transformation of the three-dimensional photograph into two on the canvas, often containing painted reflections. The goal is to make familiar things unfamiliar so we have to look. Works are rendered in acrylic, oil, colored pencil, pastel, and watercolor. Often there is a final coat of varnish, which lends a magical feel to the most mundane objects. A photorealist painting can take up to a year to complete. To paraphrase Mr. Mizell, photorealists use the camera to gather information for inspiration. Each artwork is a landscape, portrait, and still life. The first artist's work we're going to look at is uh, Audrey Flax, and her, her work is called Wheel of Fortune Vanitas. It was painted over uh, the course of a year, 1977 to 1978. The painting is eight feet by eight feet, and it is acrylic and oil on canvas. Audrey Flack is credited as the inventor of photorealism. This painting tells the story of her life as an artist, woman, and mother of two daughters, one of whom is autistic. It is made magical through its details that offer many points of entrance into the painting. Here, she juxtaposes the excesses of today's consumer culture with the early 17th century Dutch vanitas which used religious and moral symbols in still life paintings that told of the fragility of life. While she often used an airbrush, as do many photorealists to apply paint, here she used a delicate brush application to get the gleam and shine of her work. Take a look at all the elements in the layered objects. The colors and placements make this a breathtaking work. A skull and a tarot card, a painting of a picture of her youngest daughter, the painter reflected in the silver ball on the upper right the red lipstick in the shade we all want. She composed the still life on her dining room table using scotch tape to keep it all in place. She said it took her as long to make the arrangement as it did to make the painting. It was in the 1970s that her earlier styles of abstractions of color and line and of large blocks of color gave way to photorealism. She began to paint images she found in the news as well as art historical figures such as Tintoretto. 
I always wanted to draw realistically, she said. For me, art is a continuous discovery into reality and exploration of visual data. The next artist we're going to uh, talk about is Ben Schoenzeit and his Buffalo Bill, which is acrylic on linen, 72 by 72 inches. In the late 1960s, Ben Schoenzeit discovered the camera, the projector, and airbrush, which would let him realize his visions on canvas. Color, story, and space were a part of that ambition. I've always been an artist, he said. He spent a year in Europe where he painted small gouache color fields with floating objects. Please take a look at Buffalo Bill. This is a softer palette, one that pays homage to the Impressionists, as you can also see from the upper right corner. Center is Buffalo Bill, riding through the detritus of common items. We can feel the depths in the room because of its perspective, the blurry background, and vibrant bill front and center, and the way some objects are partially visible. Are we inside a glass cabinet in an old thrift store? There is also the junk, which is carelessly, or so it seems, strewn around with small price tags. The fuzzy flower behind Bill brings the legend alive. One of Ben's goals is to bring the outside world into his interior creative world. At age five, he lost an eye. He was operated on, then spent a year in a dark room and wore dark glasses. What that gave him was a different way to perceive space and the ability to see through one eye. Also, it gave him the patience to be alone for long periods of time, which is essential for an artist, especially given a photorealist's attention to detail. When asked why he painted rather than photographed his subjects, he replied, photographs can make mechanical copies. A painting is building a new and powerful thing, unique, original, one of a kind. Next slide, please. This is Before the Journey by Charles Bell. Uh, it was painted in 1986 in pastel and colored pencil on board. Charles Bell's subjects are vintage toys, pinball machines, gumball machines, marbles, paperweights, dolls, and action figures arranged in imaginary scenes and dynamic compositions cast in dramatic studio lighting. His work, done mostly in oil, is noted for the glass-like surface and largeness, largeness to deny narratives to his works, and his sources were chosen via emotion, which he painted with hyper-realistic precision. He was known for his skill at staging and painting a still life tableau. He sought to bring majesty to the mundane. Charles Bell had no formal training, yet by 1980 he could quit his job as an accountant at the International Nickel Court because the sales of his paintings were able to support him. Please look at Before the Journey. The color palette is childlike in its boldness, and the three comrades are on their way to where? There is a feeling of motion in the painting. The toys in scale would be delightful, but here as giant figures against a dull brick, almost smoky background, they would dominate any child's world. The gleam on the toys suggest a fresh from the box, freshness, newness. Bell's works can be seen at the Metropolitan Museum, the Guggenheim, the Hiroshima Museum <clears throat> of Contemporary Art, and his home gallery, Louis K. Mizell Gallery in New York City. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is a gouache on paper by Richard Estes that was painted in 1973. Known for his reflective, clean, and inanimate city and geometric landscapes, Richard Estes is regarded as one of the founders of photorealism. Estes stays true to his photographic source. If there are stickers, signs, and window displays, they are always depicted backwards because of the reflection. His work rarely includes litter or snow around buildings, 
which are always painted in daylight hours to suggest <clears throat> vacant and quiet Sunday mornings. His work has mostly been described as super realism. His paintings from the early 1960s are from city dwellers engaged in everyday activities. Beginning around 1967, he began to paint storefronts and buildings with glass windows and the images reflected in these windows. His paintings are based on his own color photographs, which capture reflections that would change in the light and time of a day. Estes wanted his objects to be recognizable, but to retain the evanescence of reflections. In Untitled, we see a slick rendering of an automobile with a light playing off its surface. It is a convertible, a classic American icon. The reflection in the store window is backward. We are seeing only half of the car, which lends a sense of movement. The use of gouache gives a more opaque and matte quality to the painting, giving us a head-on perspective. The painting has the dull green gleam of a new car. Richard Estes' works have been exhibited at the Met, the Whitney, and the Guggenheim. In 1971, Estes was granted a National Council for the Arts Fellowship and was also elected into the National Academy of Design as an associate member before becoming a full academician in 1984. Next slide, please. Robert Nywick. Uh, this is Al's Diner, Oil on Canvas. Robert Nywick is considered a second generation photorealist known for painting mid-century roadside culture and contemporary cityscapes such as theaters, diners, cafes, and gas stations. He also documents police photos of accused killers with a Versailles palette, gray tones to suggest sculpture. We see Al's diner against the dusky twilight the painter favors so he can capture the lights thrown by the stores, restaurants, and bars. The lights add to the three-dimensional sense of the work. There is a melancholy in the lighting as there is in all his paintings, and there is and, as, and his love of American signs in the 50s and 60s come through clearly. Because of the way the diner is positioned, the way every object is placed, we get the strong feel of not only of a three-dimensional place, but also a sense of loss as such icons hardly exist today. Thank you.